Good morning, everyone, or I guess good afternoon. I'm not gonna lie, my, fl my plane landed at about 4 a.m., and so for the last two hours, I've just been drinking a lot of coffee, so I'm very fired up to be here. <laughs> um, anyways, I'm Nadia Okamoto, I'm 21 years old, and I'm here to talk about periods. <laughs> All right, so I know that menstruation is not the most popular or common thing to be fired up and obsessed with, but I very much am. But since it's not so common, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the personal story behind my passion for periods. My passion for periods comes from a really personal place. I founded the organization when I was 16 years old, during a time after my family experienced living without a home of our own. And during this time, as we were couch surfing with closest friends, trying to make ends meet, my bus commute to school turned from about 12 minutes to over two hours long on public transportation here in Portland. And where I would change buses was, as an, was in an area of Portland called Old Town Portland, where about five, six years ago, that area had about 10 homeless shelters in a two block radius. So regularly to and from school, I would see these homeless women, and being the sort of quirky, extroverted 15-year-old I was, started striking up conversations with them. And at that time, I became very fascinated by stories of hardship, sort of to try to better understand what my family is going through, but also, I think, to distract myself from what my family is going through. And I would ask them things like, how did you get here? What's your living situation? Do you have a job? Do you try to get a job? Where's your family? And then I started asking, what's the most challenging thing about your living situation? And that's how I discovered the unaddressed natural need of periods. Through asking that question, I, I collected this accidental anthology of their stories of using toilet paper and socks and brown paper grocery bags and cardboard to take care of their periods. And the moments that stuck with me were when they would show me how they could rip off a side of the cardboard they were sitting on, taking off the sides, rubbing the middle in between their hands, and using it as a menstrual pad. And it was this wake-up call for me, because even in this time when, you know, pessimistically as a 16-year-old, it was easy to compare myself to others at the private school I was attending, I would hear these stories and realize how much privilege I held in, in knowing that I never had to use things like cardboard or toilet paper to take care of my periods because I had a menstrual cup, right? And hearing these story, stories sort of catalyzed this maybe unhealthy obsession with period poverty for me, <laughs> where in my free time, I would sit by myself or stay up late and just try to Google things about period poverty. I just wanted to know more. And through simple Google searching, learned that periods are the number one reason why girls miss school in developing countries because of the cultural stigma around a girl's first period. In many countries, the first period is often the time that leads to her dropping out of school, getting married early, undergoing female genital mutilation or social isolation. And then I started researching period poverty in the U.S. I learned that period pain is a leading cause of absenteeism more than the common cold in the U.S. And while we know that, we're not doing anything about it. And then in 2014, I learned that 40 states, now the number's 35, so we're better, but 40 states in the U.S. had a sales tax on period products because they're considered luxury items. Meanwhile, products like Rogaine and Viagra are considered essential goods and don't have that tax. And I remember learning this and trying, like literally refreshing the page, trying to make sure that I was seeing this right and thinking, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> right? Like, when I learned that, I felt like the U.S. was telling me that old man hair growth and erections were considered more of a necessity than over half of our population feeling clean, confident, and capable 100% of the time. And it was sort of all of this culminated together that I decided like I needed to do something. And so I decided that I wanted to start a nonprofit. And I didn't know what the fuck that meant, but <laughs> I knew that my mom had worked in nonprofits and the adults in my life to use the word nonprofits as like explaining helping other people, right? So I decided I was gonna start a nonprofit, and with my mom sort of helping to coach me along the way, help the right co-founder, I identified a guy in my class named Vince. And I had never really talked to him before, but after talking to my mom, realized I needed a partner who could do the finances and the small details and the logistics, the things that I was not so good at. And so Vince and I had never really talked before, but he had the reputation of being really kind, compassionate, and also always the first kid done with math Excel spreadsheets, and then <laughs> would walk around the class helping everyone else so the class could move on. So that was the co-founder that I needed and wanted. So I remember 16 years old, I ran up to him after class one day, and I was like, oh my gosh, Vince, I'm so excited, like super caffeinated as well, <laughs> being like, I want to start a nonprofit about periods. And he was like, okay, slow down, I'm really interested, but before we get started, can you just remind me what menstruation is, 
right? So our first business, our first order of business was literally looking up what periods were and explaining to him what tampons were. And, but he, he took a leap of faith and he said, okay, let's do this. And that Saturday, we gathered at a Starbucks for about six hours and we just kept looking at each other like, we don't know what we're doing, giggling along the way, but had this mentality of like being so passionate about this and just thinking, even though we don't know what we're doing and we don't even know what we're trying to create, we're gonna do it anyways. So we sat there at Starbucks and we Googled questions like, what is a nonprofit? And what is the IRS? And what is, a, what is a board of directors? And what is a Form 990? And became a 501c3 organization by following these simple steps we were finding on Google. Didn't realize we needed a lawyer to become a nonprofit, but so we just did it ourselves. And Really, the biggest barrier was just convincing my mom and his dad to be the signers on these forms because we were 16 and couldn't start a nonprofit, right? But we did it anyways. And we literally just, I just had this like young, scrappy, hungry energy. Like I was like, okay, I need to raise money to buy period products to get them to 20 homeless women a week in Portland because I knew 20 homeless women, right? And so I just said, okay, first order of business, I'm gonna raise some money. And I would literally talk to anyone who would listen. I would try playing guitar on 23rd Street and raise like 20 bucks in five hours, realize that was not a good use of my time. <laughs> So I started just trying to go into places where people already had to be and talk to them about periods. I would like go to Fidelity Insurance and ask if I could talk at their staff meetings. I would go to the Jiffy Lube Auto Mechanic store and talk, ask if I could talk to their staff meetings. And I would just like try to present and try these different pitches and I would notice, especially when talking to like male dominated spaces like the auto mechanic store, when I said the word periods and menstruation, their sandwiches would drop in disgust. <laughs> And for some reason, as I was founding the organization, that was one of the most motivating things. Because when I would see people physically react to me simply saying the word period, I would have this reaction like, you're the problem, right? <laughs> right? And so with that energy, I was like, okay, just keep saying the word periods, talking about this more. My mom really pushed me to also just like focus on periods and just try to solve this issue. Vince and I just started gathering money. I refined my pitch by practicing, went on eventbrite.com, found every pitch competition in the area, won all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we just started buying every store. We would travel to all around Oregon and all around Washington, literally wipe them out of period products, gather our friends together and put together packages of period products. Uh, because we realized when I started calling nonprofits, on our first order of business, we like took some of the packages, went out to Old Town Portland, started distributing them, and were out there for four hours with a line of homeless women that had lined up on the bridge saying, oh my gosh, we've never seen period products being offered. We go to these shelters and they don't have period products. And simply by talking to the organizations in downtown Portland, we realized, and actually around the US as well at the time, most nonprofits and shelters don't provide free period products in a really accessible way, either due to a lack of funds or a lack of displayed need, right? Because these products are expensive, so they keep them behind the counter. So for a homeless menstruator to, go, to get them, they have to go up to often the male authority of the shelter and say, hello, I'm menstruating and I need a pad, right? But because of the stigma around periods, that is not always the most comfortable thing to do, so the need goes completely unaddressed. So we just started putting them into packages in this formula that we thought would address the average menstrual cycle, giving them out to every shelter in the area and just stocking them so they could give them out freely. Because we were young, we were young teenagers at the time, social media had become like sort of an extension of our self-expression. We were just updating our social media feeds with what we were doing, just trying to gather our friends and get them together. No real goal of like expanding nationally at that point, but just trying to let our family friends know what we were up to. And within a few months, we had hundreds of messages from students, just young people, journalists from all over the country who were saying, we've never thought about this, how do we do this in our community? So we wrote down what I, we did in ours in a Google Doc and started spreading it around and calling it a chapter playbook. And within a year, we had like six chapters and all around the country and we were have, building this national global period network. Fast forward four years, what is period today? 
Period is now a global youth-run NGO that fights to end period poverty and period stigma through service, education, and advocacy. So what that looks like is we distribute period products to people in need. We're trying to change the way people think, talk, and learn about periods through education. And we're now working in policy from the local to the national level, trying to get period products to be freely accessible in schools, shelters, and prisons, repealing the tampon tax in the remaining 35 states, and trying to get things like food stamps to cover period products because they don't currently. Um, we've, our network alone has actually passed about 12 pieces of legislation over the last year, one of those being here in Portland, Oregon, where our Grant High School chapter pushed the PPS district to now invest 60000 in the next year to get period products and um, dispensers in all unisex restrooms to provide period products for the 17,000 menstruating students in the high school district here, which is really exciting. Oh. So this is a little bit of our impact map. You can see when we started, it was literally just me, Vince, my mom, his dad, just kind of trying to start this up. We, through spreading our message on social media, started getting chapters. Um, by the end of 2017, we were at 200,000 periods served and about 140 chapters. Now, we're about halfway through 2019. To date, we've addressed over 580,000 periods through product distribution. That's distributing tampons, pads, menstrual cups, cloth pads. And we've registered over 400 campus chapters in all 50 states and seven countries. Yeah. So, simply through that mentality of just taking action, we've grown into this full-blown movement. And we're actually... <laughs> We're actually now, we're now the largest youth-run NGO in women's health in the world, and we're the fastest growing one here in the United States, which is really exciting. Um, so this is, this is my, one of my favorite pictures, all of this crowd. This was the first global conference we had. We just had our last one in uh, January in New York City, where we literally gathered like 300 chapter members from around the country, from like eight different countries, from around the US, and we just get together for a two full day conference, and we talk about the menstrual movement. Right? And last October, I published my debut book with Simon & Schuster called Period Power and Manifesto for the Menstrual Movement. I'll be signing copies downstairs after. Shameless plug. <laughs> um, but we really just went forward with this mentality of like, wow, until now, like periods are still, we still have so much more to go to destigmatize periods. So how can we just use social media channels, use earned media channels, like deliver and build out these national campaigns to break the stigma around periods and talk about period poverty as the urgent and solvable issue that it is, right? So whether that's creating shirts and getting everyone wearing shirts that say, anything you can do, I can do bleeding, or <laughs> getting into big earned media outlets like Oprah Magazine and just refusing to take our period shirts off, right? But just trying to start conversations about periods. And when I think about why it's so important for me to care about periods and why I think everyone should care about periods, the end goal for me is not just about menstruation, but it's really about gender equality and equity. And when you look at how gender equality is defined, the factors really fall into these four buckets of education, healthcare, employment and economic mobility, and representation in politics and decision making. I've already talked about how this barrier of uh, lack of access to period products is a significant obstacle for uh, women, girls, and menstruators from achieving their full potential in education and economic mobility. This is a matter of healthcare, and part of our motivation to break the stigma is also to get rid of what we call the trust gap, right? Which is the issue of when menstruators go to their doctors or medical professionals, there's this lack of trust where medical professionals and doctors will often dismiss or minimize their period pain or experience with PMS, right? And and kind of one of the outcomes of that is like with what's happening with endometriosis. Endometriosis is a, is a condition that over 10% of women in America have, but the majority of women who have it don't know that they have it because it's really hard to diagnose. Because when someone goes up and talks about the symptoms of endometriosis, it can often be dismissed as just period pain. Right? So a lot of our work to break the stigma in the healthcare industry is just educating doctors about what are the different symptoms uh, that can be more serious conditions rather than just period cramps, right? And encouraging people to also talk openly about their period experiences. 
This is also something that periods in menstruation and the stigma around it has continuously been a reason for why women, girls, menstruators aren't promoted to higher positions of political power and decision-making power. I think a really good example of that is in 2016 when Hillary Clinton was running for president and people were literally publishing op-eds and making comments about how Hillary Clinton couldn't be president because 25% of the time she'd be menstruating. Which just goes to show the lack of education because Hillary Clinton was about a decade too old to get her period in 2016. <laughs> so, but I put this up here to show that, like I, yes, I'm in this for the menstrual movement, which I define as the fight for equitable access to menstrual hygiene and breaking down the stigma around periods. And the term the menstrual movement is actually a term that I coined in 2016 at my first TED talk here in Portland. And it's now become like the, the label of what this movement is. But when I think about the menstrual movement, the end goal is not just about periods. But what I love about the menstrual movement is that it's a very solvable issue and something that we can really move the needle on that we have to address before we reach gender equality and equity, right? And I think that as we go forward in our work, we have to keep that bigger picture in mind. For me, how we solve this issue is not through continuing direct service till end of time. For me, the way we solve this issue is through policy, right? It keeps me up at night realizing that if we disappeared, the only real impact, long-term impact we've made is the policy that we've changed, right? But I think before we can pass that policy and keep making those national waves and legislative change, we have to change culture, right? Which honestly starts in rooms like this, where we all talk about period poverty openly and we can all say menstruation without giggling. Right? So how we're gonna solve this in the next year or so, we're continuing our work to empower young period warriors around the US. We're really ramping up our efforts to repeal the tampon tax, and we're continuing our work from a policy angle to end period poverty in schools. When I think about the journey that took me to where I am today, it really starts with me just being a passionate person who is acknowledging my weaknesses and just saying when I didn't know answers, I would just Google it or ask the mentors in my own space. And that sort of energy to, is, is what took me to other experiences like running for office when I was 19. So <laughs> when I was a freshman, when I was a freshman at Harvard, I similarly to how I got obsessed with periods, got obsessed with housing affordability just by walking around Cambridge and noticing the gentrification that was very visible. Um, and I, I swear I have friends because when I tell my founding story, it makes it sound like I have no friends. But <laughs> in my free time, I would sit by myself and Google things. And I ended up downloading every publicly accessible report on income inequality and housing affordability and ending up with this 80-page Word document about what I thought city council could be doing better. And I realize now this was a little bit of a petty way to tell city council what they could be doing to better. But I started taking this document to them and saying, Let, get young people involved, talk to us. Like, we are, we are a college town, why aren't we involved in local politics? And they started joking with me after the first few months of like, oh, if you have so many ideas, why don't you run yourself? So I got frustrated, looked it up on Google, looked up what it took to run for office, realized that all you had to be was 18. And so I felt more than fucking qualified because I was 19. <laughs> so <laughs> I downloaded the form. Everything starts with a government form. Downloaded the form to became, become a candidate and created a video, launched it overnight, uh, woke up the next morning, it had gone viral, and I accidentally became the youngest Asian American to run for office in the US. And <laughs> We ran a campaign. I convinced six of my friends to turn down their paid summer internships. We lived together. We knocked on the most doors than any of the 26 other candidates. We knocked on 22,000 doors in that summer. And we just started going and going. We didn't win, but we made history with student and youth turnout. And that was enough for me to be like, yes, we did it. <laughs> But when I think about like the energy, like I don't stand up here as a young entrepreneur or activist and feel like a tokenized activist in this generation of young people. I actually feel like I'm very privileged to have this platform, but I'm surrounded by peers in Generation Z that are changing the world or trying to change the world with similar energies. I'm passionate about Generation Z for four main reasons. One, we're big. We are the largest segment of a population in the history of the world at 32% 32 of the global population. We're 46% of the total media audience, so when you think about how brands, politicians, these decision makers, are who they're trying to reach, Gen Z is almost a majority of that, right? We are driven change makers. Over 80% of us look at the world and are frustrated by it and feel a heightened sense of individual responsibility to do something. Third, we know the digital world. Over 80% of us have smartphones by the time we are 10 years old. And social media is not 
not just something we do for fun, but it, it truly is part of how we express ourselves to the outside world. Lastly, we're socially progressive. We have two main nicknames. One is the plurals, because when we make decisions and create our political opinions, we think in terms of we, right, our community, what's best for my family, what's best for my demographic. Secondly, our second nickname is the genderless generation, because less than 50% of us identify as totally heterosexual or cisgender, right? These factors of what, of what makes Gen Z special and what makes us a game-changing generation, I think comes down to this idea that unlike millennials, much love to millennials, we don't just, we don't just want a seat at the table. Generation, doesn't, generation Z does not just want a seat at the table, we want to flip the damn table, right? <laughs> We're looking at the world, we want to participate, we realize we have that responsibility, responsibility to make change, and we're looking at the system saying we need to participate, but we can't just participate in the system, we need to change the system, and then all have an equal playing field in participating. So as I ran for office and wrote this book and started this organization, I kept finding myself in rooms with politicians and companies who were all trying to engage young people. And I'd be invited into these rooms and they'd be like, we want to engage you. And I always realized that there was a token old white man in the corner who was the youth expert, right? <laughs> and they would look at me being like, we've never talked to a young person like you. And I would look at them being like, I feel like I'm the lamest one of the lesser eloquent young people in my friend group, right? It just means you haven't been talking to young people. So from that mentality, last year I founded a company with a few friends of mine called Juve Consulting, and we are a Generation Z marketing agency. We just opened up our whole floor office in Times Square. Um, but so we're a Generation Z marketing agency, I'm the oldest person in the company and I'm 21, but we now work with small companies and campaigns all the way up to now over 30 Fortune 500 companies designing marketing strategies, digital campaigns, event activations, and we basically go to big corporate executives and we say, rather than just talking about young people and trying to engage with them, just talk to us directly, right? Treat us like partners and not just like guinea pigs. So I stand here before you just to try to evoke this call to action of join us in just looking at the people around you and trying to empower the younger people to be partners and not just guinea pigs you're learning from, but also just wanting to co-create things, right? But also saying, join me as a period warrior in the menstrual movement. And sometimes the, so the solution to just breaking the stigma around you is just turning to a neighbor or friend and saying, let's talk about periods. Why is period poverty such an issue? And why are we so afraid to talk about something so natural? Thank you. Thank you.